Welcome back. Well, think about this as you watch this next story on your geolocated handheld device or maybe satellite TV. It has only been 60 years since the U.S. figured out how to put something into orbit. It was called Explorer 1, and it was rushed into production after the Soviets beat the Americans into space. Well, on this 60th anniversary of that launch, Discovery Channel's Dan Riskin takes us back to that era when many of us were alive, but we knew next to nothing about space. Please clear the launching area. On a launch pad at Cape Canaveral, the pride of the United States is at stake, riding on top of a Jupiter C rocket. The cluster is starting its spin. Explorer 1 was a very small satellite. It was only about as tall as a person. It was only a few inches in diameter. And it had an enormous impact. Enormous, because just four months before, the Soviet Union beat the US into space by launching the world's first satellite, Sputnik 1. America had to respond to the Soviet successes. This was a, a, a major issue. Now, at the start of the space race, the United States is playing catch up. Roger Launius knows the story behind it all very well. I spent many years at the National Air and Space Museum as well as at NASA as the chief historian. In the mid 50s, both superpowers announced plans to launch satellites in 1957 to study the Earth's upper atmosphere. The Soviets focused their efforts on one project to get into space first, while the U.S. holds a competition between agencies to build a rocket and satellite. President Eisenhower wants the first spacecraft to be a civilian satellite, not a military one, because he has a secret plan. He wants to fly military spy satellites over the Soviet Union when the technology is ready. But to get around international sovereignty laws, he needs to set a legal precedent by first flying a civilian satellite over his Cold War rival. So the underdog team in the competition is the military one, the Army Ballistic Missile Agency, with its chief rocket scientist, Werner von Braun, the mastermind of Nazi Germany's rocket program. During the end of World War II, he and about 120 of his German rocketeers who had built the V-2 surrendered to the Americans and came to the U.S. The front runner is a civilian run lab at the U.S. Navy. The Naval Research Lab had a program underway already to build a rocket. So they proposed the Vanguard project and it was successful. The military team is angry. They believe their rocket, the Jupiter, is ready to reach orbit. Eisenhower tells them, do not even think of sneaking in a launch, but defying orders, they set aside several rockets. Meanwhile, the Jet Propulsion Lab in California is also frustrated. They want to make the first U.S. satellite. So much so that they too go against the president's orders and secretly build one. The spacecraft that will one day be called Explorer 1 is hidden away in a cabinet. Explorer was done sort of under the table, after the fact, without too much money set aside. Meanwhile, at the Naval Research Lab, James Van Allen, the physicist in charge of the satellite science package, is so unimpressed by Vanguard that he makes sure his instrument can also fit inside Explorer. He hedged his bets and worked on both of them. Then, on October 4th, 1957, the game changes. Sputnik got everybody who wasn't paying attention to space before now to suddenly pay attention. A month later, another coup. Sputnik 2 is launched with the first animal in orbit, a dog named Laika. Eisenhower had to respond aggressively and so he ordered the Vanguard project to move out very smartly to launch their own satellite. People who were associated with that program said we're not ready, but they Nonetheless, attempted to launch on the 6th of December. As the world watches, the media dubbed it Kaputnik, Flopnik. Now it's all up to the B team. The Army and JPL get the nod from Eisenhower. 
Explorer 1's science mission is to investigate radiation around the world. Scientists had theorized that the Earth's electromagnetic field captures particles from the sun and cosmic rays, although that had never been observed directly. But right now, much more than science is on the line. The seven-story high Jupiter rocket works, it fires for almost two and a half minutes. After it burns out, a series of stages boosts the spacecraft faster and faster. Then, Explorer is on its own. A solid fuel rocket pushes it into its final orbit. They knew that the launch had sent the satellite up, but had it deployed properly? Was it broadcasting properly? They don't know because there's no worldwide network of antennas to listen to the spacecraft like there is today. They did not realize uh, until just before the press conference that it had been successful. Uh, Werner von Braun got a telephone call from the listening stations. They indicated that they had received data back from the spacecraft. It's a triumph, but soon the data has them scratching their heads. The Geiger counter just went haywire when it got up there, and it was sending signals that some people thought was a false signal. In reality, it was not. It was just the strength of the radiation belt. Explorer 1 reveals a vast radiation belt around the Earth. The fact that we confirmed and began to understand the very significant Van Allen radiation belt was an enormous scientific breakthrough, and it's still fundamental to what we understand about the geophysical properties of the Earth. Without them trapping the cosmic rays and the particles from the sun, life would not exist on this particular planet. As for Sputnik, friction with the atmosphere slowed it down and it lost altitude. It burned up a few weeks before Explorer 1 was launched. Explorer 1 flew higher, so it didn't burn up until 1970. Explorer and Sputnik opened the heavens to exploration. Every spacecraft after them are their descendants. Well, it's amazing when you realize that only 11 years after the launch of Explorer 1, Americans were standing on the moon. We'll be right back.